Rodney. Hey. Hey, what's going on? Howdy. Uh, you got your flight. You know, I, I was like, man, I wish I had a superhero. <laughs> yeah, I got my flash shirt on. Yeah, I dig it. I dig it a lot. So, all right. Well, Rodney, um, thanks so much for uh, for making the time. Yeah, uh, my pleasure. Yeah, we've already got uh, a couple of live viewers. Oh, great. So, yeah. And like I said, this will be both live and then, you know, I'll push it out right. after the fact. So either way. So uh, how how is your lovely Sunday going? Uh, okay, so far, very yeah. hectic. Uh, am I coming through good and clear? I think so. Yeah, looks good. Okay, to me. good. All right, yeah. awesome. I I don't usually use this mic on this uh, computer, so that's okay. what I was asking. Is that a blue, uh, yeah? Is that a blue Yeti? Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, same. Yeah, you've got the the kind of black one. I've got the regular. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's like the most ubiquitous podcasting it microphone is. in the world. It is. So yeah, I am I am not a maverick. I go with what works. Okay, cool. Well, <laughs> I know it's I know it's your Sunday morning, so we'll just yeah. uh, kind of jump right in, and sure. you know, if we get if we get uh, viewers and everything, we're going to be talking today um, about your spectaculars yes. uh, superhero RPG, which yes. is on Kickstarter. Before we got into that, I had a couple other questions for you, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, no, no problem. Happy to, we, happy to answer whatever. Uh, so are you reading anything good at the moment? Did I lose you? Uh, maybe. Yeah. Uh, are you there? No. Okay. Hey there. Uh, okay. Good. Yeah. We, this is what we in the business call an icebreaker question. Kind yeah, of warm things good. up. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, welcome back to Shane Plays. You were yes, on you. my radio show like over a year ago for uh, yeah. Dust City Outlaws. So About a year and a half ago. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much for again for coming on. So, sure. um, I, I, you know, we in the biz we have an icebreaker question. Uh, are you reading anything good right now, or even anything oh. bad that you want to warn people against? Uh, well, so right now I'm rereading. Um, Patrick Rothfuss's uh, Name of the Wind. Uh, I just actually just started rereading it a few days ago. I do this thing where periodically, like, I will go back to a book that I've read, uh, even though, like, I like I'm like, oh, okay, well, I pretty much remember everything that happened in it. Uh, I'll do it sometimes just for like the comfort of like, okay, I don't want to think about too much whether I like this or not. I just want to read a thing that I know that I'm going to like. Uh, and I've been kind of on a kick of that lately, so I, I'm I'm just restarting uh, Name of the Wind, and uh, I just finished a reread of Stephen King's dark tower series mm. from, from front to back. Yeah. That's, that's talk about an epic. I mean, that yeah. is, that's an epic story. I remember, I remember reading the gunslinger in the late eighties when I was like a junior yeah. or a senior in high school. And then I just finished, um, last year I, mm -hmm. I audio booked like the final two or three books. Oh, okay. Sure. And, uh, wow. What an ending. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, wow. yeah. I, you um, know, the thing is, like, I started reading it when I was in high school, which I think I started right as Wizard and Glass came out. Uh, uh -huh. So that should be, let you pinpoint exactly how old I am. Right. <laughs> but I started reading it in high school, and uh, you know, I I've always liked Stephen King's stuff, but I've never been like, oh, like, you know, Stephen King is my favorite author. Um, but every time I read one of his books, I'm always sort of reminded about, like, oh yeah, I really like this guy's writing styles, right? So. Uh, you know, it's nice to go back and, and listen to it again now with my, or I'll read it again now with my sort of adult mind, uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to like my high school and, and college mind uh, and see how it, you know, how it affected me. And, you know, basically it turns out that I think I paid more attention this time to his, uh, sort of shared universe elements than I did the first time around and also caught a lot more of his sort of, uh, writers wink wink nudge nudge to the audience uh, mm -hmm. there's a lot more of that than there's i remember being that. in there yeah, there's a ton of that i mean he i i don't even know how to put it it's like i don't know if, should i be should i feel awkward or should be should i be impressed he wrote himself in you know, i love it like yeah. I, I i i think it was you know you could look at it and be like oh well it was very uh egotistical for him to do that but at the same time the way he wrote himself went in first of all he's very self-deprecating in Big the way time. he writes himself yeah. right he, he um, yeah he tears himself down yeah right? but i mean like he it also kind of reinforces how personal the story is for him which i really like that aspect of it right where he's like hey this is something that is fundamental to who i am as a person and to not write myself into the story would be to ignore the fact that like this thing has haunted me for my whole life. Right. Basically. Which yeah. I think kind of tying it into his like being hit by the truck and everything has really like, it really kind of shows you like, Hey, this story is like, it's an interesting story, but it also lets you know, like, Hey, I, I really am fundamentally shaped by this story. Right. Definitely. Yeah. And if you read, um, 
on writing. He spends a lot of time in yeah. on writing talking about the fact that he got hit by that yeah. man or, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, okay. Well, um, yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, I can't, I can't recommend it enough. Even if people don't like Stephen King's writings, the sheer size and scope and mm -hmm. chutzpah or whatever you want to call it, <laughs> the whole thing is, is mind boggling. So, um, yeah. but it's just as far as an adventure yarn, I actually think Wizard of Glass is my favorite installment just as oh, that's great. I, I loved the, you know, it was the closest we got to what Roland of Gilead's like life was, you know, and what that world was like before things quote unquote moved on, you know. Yeah. So, um and Name of the Wind, of course, is fantastic if people haven't oh, yeah. read that, you know. And people are always, you know, beating on Patrick Rothfuss. He'll get the next one out when he gets it out, you know. So I'm 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 cool, I'm content. So um is it so the one thing I want to ask you though, how do you think? Do you want to go on record with how you think he's going to frame the third book or how things finish? Like his cover. No, no, it, I, I can't you know, guess. Right. Yeah. Like that's the thing is, you know, even rereading, like rereading it, having this, I think this is my fourth time through. Right. Right. I, I can't predict. I have no idea. Right. Like I, I'm reading it and like, it's clear he, how much he has charted it out because right. there are things that are dropped, like references that are dropped in the first book that get recalled back again and again in the second book. Right. And so he has a plan. I'm not going to try and second guess him because I yeah. think it would be a, like I would mess it up and not get it right. But then B, I think it will like sort of mess up the journey for me a little bit. Sure. So I'm just sort of on along for the ride on this one. Well, I, I, I'll speculate uh, that I he's dropping pretty big hints that Kavoth isn't lying, but there may be a little bit of an exaggeration, you know, in the storytelling. Uh, like, I'm thinking specifically of that that fight at the end of the second book, you know, mm -hmm. where it was like, really? And mm -hmm. but, you know, and I'll just I won't go in any deeper uh, if people haven't read it. Um, it you know, so I, I so I'm curious what happens because there's a certain in vulnerability to a character when a story is being related, you know, this is what happened before, but I have a feeling at some point it's going to catch up to where Kvothe is now. Does that make sense? So it's yeah. like, what will happen then? That'll be really interesting to see what happens. Oh, then. you know, so, and talking yeah. about the unreliable narrator there, I right. think it's been really interesting on this read through. I paid a lot more attention to when the narration pulls back to third person. And that's when you can really get a sense of like, okay, how much of this is embellishment and how much of it is true. And like, I'm just, I'm in the part uh, where he is on the streets of Tarbian at the very, like right. pretty, pretty early in the first book. Raise your hand. If when you're reading the book, you called it Tarbine. And then you heard in the audio book that it was Tarbian. That was me. I called it Tarbine. Right. So. I mean, you know, tar <laughs> Tarbine sounds like the slang term. It's like the big app, right? right? Like right. Uh, the big Tarbine. The big okay. Tarbine. Uh, but yeah, like, so, you know, when he relates something and then occasionally pull back to third person and focus on him, you can kind of get a sense of when something is genuine and when something is an embellishment. And so that's been an interesting thing for me to kind of pay attention to more this time through. Right. Well, it's good stuff. All right. Well, we're not yeah. here to talk about yeah, yeah, yeah. Stephen King or, or Patrick Rothfuss, uh, although that's good stuff to read. I will say I just listened to the audio book of Haunting of Hill House, which is oh, yeah. very good. And, you know, a lot of people are watching the Netflix. My and wife so is started, watching it right now. Well, I started watching it after reading the book mm -hmm. and they heavily adapted it. I'll just say that, yeah, you know, the, sure. the, the book relies a lot more on like psychological terror. And mm -hmm. I mean, there's really super, supernatural elements, but it's much more of like almost like paranoia and psychological terror than outright sure. scares where the, the TV show, which is good, is, you know, pretty heavily adapted. But right. Anyway, moving on. Uh, so are you still with Bungie? I am, yes. Okay. Yeah, I've been there over three years now, coming up on my fourth year pretty soon. Okay. And is that still, you still, is that like, wow? Oh, yeah, you, I love it. I love okay. it. It's great. I, I've been there, like I said, for three and a half years. I'm still working on Destiny. Uh, I've gotten to work on a bunch of different teams, on a bunch of different, bunch of different projects, um, help out with some of the expansions a little bit. And right. uh, it's been great. Like, I, I love it. Um, it's it's a nice that I have, uh, you know, I was telling somebody the other day, it's nice that I have like spectaculars and Dusk City Outlaws on the side because right. like all day I go in and I work on video games. Then at night when I come home and I want to work on my side projects, I'm working on tabletop games. So even though it's game design and it's very similar, 
I'm not doing the same thing over and over again, right? So that means that like I get to exercise different parts of my brain, think about things differently. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling very satisfied right now. Nice. Well, that's good. So, um, yeah. I, you know, uh, when we talked before you had just kind of transitioned yeah. and, and if people, uh, if people aren't aware, um, you know, this is Rodney Thompson, you were on the D and D five E team, yeah. uh, which is ridiculously successful. Uh, I just saw an article, um, you know, where for two or three years in a row, there's been 30% growth year on year for D and D, yeah. which is just mind boggling. Yeah. Uh, of course, you're involved with the Lords of Waterdeep uh, board yep. game, which has been very successful. Yep. Uh, and you've had other projects. Uh, and then you went to Bungie in the world of video games, but still designing yeah. essentially role-playing scenarios and, and that sort of thing. Um, and and then you have Scratchpad Publishing, right? Which, uh, which you, that your first project is uh, was uh, Dust City Outlaws, right? That's uh, correct. Right, which uh, the elevator pitch was basically. Ocean's Eleven in a fantasy city. Basically, uh, yep. Uh, and, it, and it was designed specifically, I've got it right here. Um, I, I supported the Kickstarter. It's designed, uh, and, I, and I believe that... Uh, ...play an RPG experience without, you know, heavy, heavy, oh, we got to, you know, spend a few hours setting all this up. Um, yeah. And I, it's a lot of fun. And I just, I wanted to point out, this caught me completely by surprise. I'm going to screen share this. Uh, I was like, what the heck is this? So Neon City Outlaw. Oh, uh, yeah. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. Uh, so during the Kickstarter campaign, one of the stretch goals, or it wasn't really a stretch goal, it was a, um, uh, it was a, a, uh, uh, contributor goal, basically, right? The idea was that I would have Steve Kinson, who did a lot of work on Shadowrun, uh, and he's done a lot of work on a bunch of other things uh, that you've probably played, like Mutants and Masterminds and Blue Rose. Uh, I had Steve write a uh, cyberpunk hack for Dusk City Outlaws, so you could basically take your Dusk City Outlaws game, reskin it as cyberpunk, and play it if you wanted sort of a more Shadowrun, cyberpunk uh, style uh, game. And he turned it over and I looked at it and I was like, it's pretty good. I think I want to do more with this, right? So I took his turnover and then I added about 10,000 words to it. And then I took uh, the specialties from Dust City Outlaws and I reskinned them to be, make them make more sense in a cyberpunk game. Uh, and then I took the uh, uh, cartels and I rebuilt the cartels to basically fit this cyberpunk setting. And the idea is like in, in many ways it is uh, building on the cyberpunk ideas of like, hey, you know, in the grim future of total corporate takeover, you are nickel and dime to death as you are sort of oppressed by uh, the, you know, the fact that you are most people don't have any money and the money they have gets spent on basically everything that they need to live. And, you know, the corporate, uh, you know, the executives live in these quite literal ivory towers above everyone else, right? You know, what was interesting about, you know, sort of cyberpunk and then looking at Dusk City Outlaws, which when I built Dusk City Outlaws, I intentionally focused the core conflict of the setting on class struggle, right? Like no, the nobility versus the commoners, right? And then you have like the merchants that kind of are in this in-between space. And so like I really built every major conflict in the game kind of revolves around that struggle for like, you know, between the classes and the struggle of like people at a certain class trying to ascend up to the, you know, the, at least the power of the, the higher ranks. And that's a concept that fits perfectly mm -hmm. in cyberpunk settings. Right. Right. Definitely. So, yeah. So like I basically, you know, converted over to cyberpunk with Steve's help and made it a, you know, again, focused on that core conflict, that, that core idea that like, Hey, this is about, the class struggle between the executives and the corporations and the common citizen. So pretty easy conversion. Almost right. every plot from Dusk City Outlaws works in Neon City Outlaws. And so I released this PDF that has, you know, a full conversion guide. It has the uh, cartels that you need, it has all the specialties. So it's a pretty deluxe package uh, for, you know, a, a PDF. Uh, and you can kind of print it out and then keep it with your Dusk City Outlaws and you can, you know, do some cyberpunk uh Cyberpunk heists. 
Uh, I'm really happy with the way it came out. Uh, in fact, so much so that as I was working on, I was like, "Ah, oh, man, I kind of wish I'd done this as like a full product, <laughs> like a box set." Are so, there plans? Do you do you have any plans to maybe go that way uh, with it? We'll, we'll see. Like right now, I'm yeah. super focused on spectacular, oh, spectaculars, right? Yeah. right? Which yeah, we're yeah. yeah, we're about to get to. So totally, yeah, mo yeah. Most people are uh, hopefully going to watch this to hear about <laughs> spectaculars, but I wanted yeah. to give you a chance to yeah. catch people up. Um, now I, I've I've ran Dust City Outlaws, uh, okay. and and I had a heck of a good time doing it. Good. What what I like to do, I I have a weekly D and D game, mm -hmm. um, and what I like to do when there's like special like free RPG day events, or mm -hmm. we're going to have like a quarterly all day RPG one shot game. I like to play right. these games that I've supported and got yeah. And uh, so I ran Dust City Outlaws and uh, everybody had a really good time. Good. Now I did want to say uh, and ask you if you're getting, if you have this as well, everybody that was playing it ca came from an existing RPG background. Mm -hmm. So uh, and I didn't, I wasn't like, you know, you have to play this exactly as I wanted everyone to have fun and we all had a blast, but mentally, uh, you could tell they were going from every scene is free role-playing mm -hmm. to in this scene, because it's, it's like a heist movie. We're going to have a scene. We're going to keep it moving. Uh, it was interesting to watch them adapt to, uh, okay. You, you know, state one goal and like one piece of information mm -hmm. you want to do yeah. in this scene. And then it, you know, being natural role players, they kept wanting to, well, I want to, I want to bust out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but we still had a great time. And, yeah. um, the, the, uh, it, you know, I, I can't recommend it enough. It's, it's, uh, it's well-designed. I, and I just, I got to spend a little bit of time on dusty outlaws because I want people to understand, the quality of of the games that you make right yeah. i guess that's Thanks. backwards yeah well, right so i can see it um the uh one thing that impressed me i did an unboxing video on this when i first got it uh one thing that that i want people to know is if they invest in one of your products and uh you know spectaculars is going to be a box product as well it's a Absolutely. complete experience yep. in a box mm -hmm. the uh you know the the quality of the components in here are amazing uh they it looks really good i mean this is you know you get all these character sheets and faction sheets and uh -huh. character archetype character archetype cards um and again you know i i'm spending time on this because i i could only assume that you would bring the same sensibility to uh yeah. to spectaculars you get all this stuff yeah. Uh, you, you get information on character archetypes or classes or whatever mm -hmm. you want to, you would call it, uh, uh, on factions, you get, you got this little, it, it looks like a, like if you were traveling to a city, you get this little <laughs> traveler's guide, but it's all this lore and information about the city of new Dunhaven. And then these men, these are amazing. I've never, yeah. I was like, wow, how, how long did it take to get these right? Uh, well, so trays. So the trays were designed by Noah Adelman from uh -huh. uh, Game Trays, and he does a lot of great stuff for board games. Uh, and so, honestly, like I just told him, I was like, "Here's the, all the components. Here's kind of what I want." Uh, and I, I told him, I was like, "Oh, just give me something basic." And he came back. He was like, "Yeah, I don't really do basic. Here's the Lux right. Yeah, uh, here's it so is. He, yeah, he came back with it, and he did an amazing job. Uh, Noah, Noah, spectacular, and uh, he's going to be designing the trays for uh, Spectaculars as well. Right. Uh, and I've got him working on a little, uh, let's call it a secret project right now that I hope to be able to reveal in the near future. Uh, but yeah, it, he's, he's amazing. Noah does a great job. I, I was person. blown away when I opened up the box. Yeah. I was, you know, uh, and, and so what you have, uh, is for dust city outlaws anyway, is you have two different trays, one for yeah. basically the game master, mm -hmm. uh, uh, or, you know, uh, and then one for the players. Right. Uh, and so it's very well organized up to and including, I don't know if people can see these, uh, where it's kind of raised there yeah. that is designed. So you put these in the bottom of the box and all the other components stack in yeah. very neatly and very yep. organized. So I just, a plus man. Yeah. So, no, uh, Noah's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I've got him right. doing the tree for spectaculars as well, but uh, right. yeah, so sort of to your point, like spectaculars is going to follow in the same vein as does city outlaws, as far as being like a box set that comes with all these right. physical components that make it easier to play the game. Uh, it's going to be different components this time around because the design is different, but yeah, I'm very excited about like, I'm excited about using physical components 
to make a game easier to run off the cuff, right? Because that's one of the things that is always uh, super important to me in designing these games is I want this to be a game that you don't have to prepare for. I want it to be a game that you can sit down and on game night, you're like, oh, what should we play tonight? That you can say, oh, I want to play Dust City Outlaws or I want to play Spectaculars and not have to have done a bunch of prep work in advance. And I think physical components uh, make it a lot easier because we're not having to pass around a book and everything is contained in a single box that I can leave on the shelf. And when I pull it off, we're ready to start playing. Even the dice are included in the game, right? Uh, so like, I, I want to have that sort of quick to play or quick to get ready to play, you know, aspect of the game and using those physical components is one of the primary ways that I do that. Right. And, and it's, uh, I also want to point out it, it's got the sort of quick start, uh, dynamic of a board game, but it is a role-playing experience. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, it is a role-playing experience. You get your own character and spells and abilities. And, and my cats are evidently so excited about spectaculars that they're going berserk all around me. So if that's you hear, wonderful. If you hear chaos, uh, then, then that's just their, their sheer excitement. Yeah. If you hear uh, chaos here, it's my one and a half year old son who is currently obsessed with football. Okay. Well, Hang on, it's frozen. I don't, I, you're not moving or, or I'm not hearing anything. Well, that was fun. So sorry about that. Hey, there we go. I hope that I hope that lets me edit that out. <laughs> so I, it's it was weird. Uh, my internet didn't go down or anything, but my Google Chrome froze up. I've never uh, had happens. that happen before. So, uh, like I said, the cats exuded chaos energy. Um, yeah, and and obviously took us down. So right. Uh, okay. Anyway, yeah. Let's let's get back to it. Uh, yeah. So we we were talking about um, sort of the. Uh, the off the shelf, but yet yeah. role playing uh, uh, dynamic of of scra of uh, Dust City Outlaws, right. which you're bringing over to uh, Spectaculars. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's segue okay. over into Spectaculars. That's the main reason yeah. we're here today. Um, so I'm going to actually pull up the Kickstarter. Okay. Uh, in my um, screen there so why don't you tell us a little bit about spectaculars sure so spectaculars is a tabletop role-playing game uh where you are playing superheroes in a comic book setting but the thing is the game doesn't come with a setting by default instead what happens is that as you're playing through the game and the game includes four campaigns uh mm -hmm. as you're playing through those campaigns you're building the setting as you go along 
So before you even start, you establish some sort of basics of the setting. Uh, then you start playing, you make your heroes, and uh, the, the narrator makes their villains and makes some choices about the scenarios. But periodically, uh, the game will refer to a what I'm calling a setting element. And those setting elements right. are things like, hey, here's your government agency that deals with uh, superheroes like S.H.I.E.L.D. or Checkmate. Or here's your super science lab that's like Star Labs. Or here is your bad neighborhood like Hell's Kitchen or the East End District from Gotham or things like that. And when one of those things comes up, you basically uh, go to that setting book and it asks you a bunch of multiple choice questions that you then fill out. And then that becomes the nature of that setting element in your setting, right? So you make a bunch of decisions, you tie it into the decisions you've made earlier in the campaign. And then from that point on, every time any issue refers back to that uh, setting element, you, it, you use the one that you've defined, right? So the idea is that like, as you play through these campaigns, you're filling out all these different setting elements, you're creating heroes and villains, and eventually you're going to get to the point where you've got this box that is a fully fleshed out comic book setting with all these different elements that you define during play. And so I really want to do something uh, like this because I think that a lot of people, like people like Dust City Outlaws, but a lot of people were like, hey, what about campaign play? And I was like, well, we're not really aiming at campaign play. We're just trying to get it on the table fast, right? What I realized is there's a lot of people out there that love playing like long running campaigns or even even like medium length campaigns. Right. But to run a campaign in a lot of games, it usually involves you having to do some prep work away from the table, really like plan out your setting, plan out your story arcs and everything. And I think that's cool for like those games. But I think there's a lot of people who want that experience, but don't have the kind of time it takes to do that. Right. So. This is my attempt to basically say like, okay, I want you to have that experience of building your own world. I want you to have that experience of running a campaign, but the game is going to kind of hold your hand and not ask you to create anything until the moment that you need it, right? And then that way, as people are playing through the game, it's like, oh, we need this thing. Let's create it right now. Boom. Okay, here we go. No one's having to do like four hours of prep work outside of the session. It also means that the person running the game doesn't have to be the person running the game every single week. So like this week, maybe I sit down and I run the game for you and your group, but next week you run the game and I'm a player in your game. And it's not like I've got some lengthy plot that is, you know, dangling by a thread and you could mess it up or anything. It's just that every issue carries forward the story of our campaign and introduces new elements. And so it becomes the sort of opportunity for us to play a campaign without asking for a huge amount of commitment from any one person or really any, you know, two or three people. Right. So bringing that off the shelf play quality to campaign play and world building is sort of the primary goal of spectaculars. And then the sort of other secret goal in my head is I just wanted to make a superhero game that was easy to get on the table and start playing quickly. There's some great ones out there that I, I really love, but uh, I wanted something that was, you know, had had the sort of ease of character creation that Dust City Outlaws had. So in, in Spectaculars, basically it's, hey, pick your hero archetype, pick some powers, pick an identity, and you're ready to go. So why superhero? And I'm not opposed to superheroes at all. In fact... <laughs> Uh, I probably played more Villains of Vigilantes before I played yeah. Dungeons and Dragons. I'm a sure. huge uh, Villains of Vigilantes nerd. Um, you know, I like uh, Marvel superheroes from yeah. way back. Um, of course, Champions was one of the more well-known ones. I haven't. I, I don't think I've ever played Champions, but I, I know of it. Um, you know, there's 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 different superhero role-playing games out there. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, for a while, one of the more successful MMORPGs was was it not City, City of Heroes? Heroes. Yeah, the, yeah the, I absolutely. think I think was based or or connected somewhat with the Champions role playing game. If I remember right, I could be wrong. Um, and so I'm not opposed to superhero role playing games at all. But for you personally, why why superheroes? Sure. Well, so the big reason for superheroes, uh, well, there's there's a few reasons. First of all, because superheroes, uh, superhero comics tend to be uh, episodic. Like you have an issue that has you know a storyline that you read through, and then it's resolved by the end, or maybe it takes a couple of issues. But they tend to be very episodic, and the episodic nature of superhero stories was really important for. Uh, this game because, like I said, I didn't want there to be a lot of commitment required to run a game 
and like do a bunch of prep work and everything. And so having each issue be self-contained or maybe there's a two-parter or a three-parter makes it a lot easier for you to run this game off the cuff because it's like, okay, this, this story we're about to tell is self-contained, so I don't necessarily need to have you know, been there for the last session or, you know, I'm not buying into a commitment of like eight weeks to play through all this. So right. that sort of episodic nature of, of uh, comic books was a big part of it. Uh, yeah. The other part was when I was looking at the whole build your own setting element, uh, I started thinking about like different genres. And the nice thing about the comic book genre is if you look at superhero comics at, from like Marvel and DC and Vertigo and Image and all these different ones, You'll notice that there are certain common elements or common threads to their settings that are that can be very different from each other. But like almost every setting has uh, every superhero universe has like the government agency that deals with superheroes. Right. Almost every comic book setting has like the alternate dimension, you know, things like that. Right. And because these different comic book universes, these different superhero universes share so many common threads with each other. I, I it, it was very natural. Like, oh, okay, I can look at these different comic book, comic book universes and say, what are the common threads? And so, if you're going to create your own setting, there's going to be like that common thread. And he, and you know, I looked at other other genres like fantasy, but fantasy like it sometimes has some similar tropes, but in a lot of cases, like every fantasy setting is wildly different from everything else. So I thought that would be a little bit tougher. Uh, to to create a satisfying like world building experience that sort of played out the way that you like that didn't feel like you were too railroaded in this case like because all these different superhero settings have similar elements i felt like it would be easier for people to basically say like okay we're creating our settings version of this iconic trope right right uh so um, hold on a second. I think I'm broadcasting just me because I was screen sharing a second ago. Uh-oh. Um, so I, I mean, I agree that there's, well, let me back up for a second by comic books, by superheroes we're we're, we're talking, uh, spectaculars is what you would consider the four color span. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Spandex, uh, you know, uh, bright costumes running around and pounding on each other and all that fun stuff, which, in, which in I, general, I love, right? In general, although if you, like, there's, there are four different campaigns included with the game. One, okay. of, them, one of them is Eldritch Mysteries, which is uh, sort of your magic e type stuff, right? And that can encompass everything from, like, Doctor Strange to like, Ghost Rider or to Hellblazer, things like that, right? So that campaign actually plays out a little bit more like urban fantasy than like your big four color heroes. Right. So it, it, there is some drift there. Right. So from a game design perspective, I've heard, I know, I think even, especially like the Marvel RPG from the eighties that TSR did, mm-hmm. uh, they had a, um, I, I, they were talking about the difficulty of, of having a, a rich, robust magic system alongside you know, like a yeah. superpower system. So from a game designs, did you run into anything like that? Uh, not really, mostly because I am like the city outlaws. This game is very much depending on player creativity. Right. Okay. And so I basically assume from the very beginning that you're going to describe your power, how you want to describe it. And then you're going to make the role and it's up to you to create that creative description, not the game to tell you like, here is very specifically like what your power does. Right. So there are, you know, like uh, there's a sorcerer archetype in Eldritch mysteries, which basically it's like, okay, your powers that you have are the expression of your spells, but they also have the ability to swap out their powers, which is like, Oh, you know, a whole bunch of different spells. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm leaning more on, uh, the idea that the players handle the descriptive elements and the mechanics are actually relatively simple, right? A lot of it still just boils down to you're making a check or you're making an attack. And and that's the, uh, you mentioned in the Kickstarter, it's, it's basically the same D 100 system. Yeah. Uh, You know, here's the, here's the difficulty role. You know, yeah, it's, and, it's the same yeah. dice system as Dust City Outlaws, which I'm sort of labeling the 100 AC system because, okay. like, I I feel like you know now I'm using it in two different games, so we should probably have a name for it. Uh, uh, yeah, and to be clear, that doesn't mean 
that you can have 100 AC and be impossible to hit. That is uh, in fact correct. Yes. Yeah. That's I guess AC is ability check. So the D100 ability. Uh, it's actually advantage and challenge. Advantage which and the challenge. Black and, black and white okay. dice. Yeah. So the uh, with uh, spectaculars RPG, will we get the same something similar? Like you include the dice. And... Yep, dice will come with it. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So what you know, people with Dust City Outlaws, they actually got one, two, three, four, five sets of percentile dice. That's right. And then there's the advantage and challenge dice in here as That's well. That's right. So uh, every everything is self-contained. Plenty of yes. cardboard counters and you know mm -hmm. uh, yep. all that stuff. So now. Uh, with with Dust City Outlaws, since you were like, okay, I want to give the people the experience of basically a heist movie. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was very like, you're in this scene, now you're in this scene, now you're in this scene, and it's purposefully designed to be quick moving. Mm -hmm. uh, what Are you bringing a similar pacing uh, to... Uh, spectaculars or 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 is the the source material or whatever you want to put it does that kind of change things a little bit and how you want to pace things uh it's less rigid than dust city outlaws which is very much like it's daytime it's nighttime it's planning right. it's legwork or whatever right right there's basically only two types of scenes in uh in in spectaculars one of them is conflict scenes which is basically like a fight scene right so i mean just like any other game has like okay here's how combat works there's basically a whole way that you run conflict scenes, right? Uh, then everything else falls under the header of interlude scene, and they're much much less defined and much less sort of regimented than the ones in Dusk of the Outlaws because I didn't want it... Like, time is a huge enemy in... Dusk City Outlaws, it's not as important in a comic book. Yeah, game, there's, right? there's definitely a ticking clock. Like you have, yeah, it's night, it's day. You've got yeah. some scenarios you got, you got to do this in four days, you got to do it in three days, you got to do it. And so there's definitely that, which yeah. is like, which is a huge element of a heist movie. Let's be yeah. honest, you know. The, the only sort of big structural like mandate in Spectaculars is that usually each issue will start with a conflict scene of some kind. And that's just because like, Superhero comics tend to be pretty reactive in general. Like, oh, the bad guy does something and the heroes react to it, right? Uh, I say in general because there are some issues that start with the players basically having to figure something out or do something or, you know, whatever that's not uh, directly related to a conflict. Um, but yeah, so like it's... It, and uh, the, the interlude scenes definitely play out a lot more freeform in this game. There's less expectation that there's an obstacle in every interlude scene. There's less expectation that the uh, narrator is introducing a bunch of challenges into those scenes. It's more like, oh, you're going to go investigate this thing. Tell me what you do. Okay, now let me make a roll. Oh, you're going to go do this other thing. Tell me what you do. Okay, and make this roll, right? I mean, right. very much like how a standard role-playing game goes. I, the only difference is that I sort of label things as interlude scenes because that way, like, you know, you're either in a conflict scene or you're in an interlude, and you know, that's that's basically it, right? So you did you didn't want to feel like calling them meanwhile dot 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 scenes? No, that meanwhile. well, first of all, I don't know how fun it would be to say meanwhile dot 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 over and over again. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> yeah, stately so. Wayne Manor. Yeah, yeah, that's stately way in manner. So, uh, which which does kind of, uh, and and I want to uh, take a moment here. Uh, you know, we do we had, we we have had uh, people in chat, and we we continue to have some folks in oh, chat. Awesome. Thank you so much. If anybody out there has a question, feel free. I am kind of keeping an eye on the chat room, so I'll be I'll be happy to pass that uh, to uh, Rodney. Uh, you know, and bring it up. Also, uh, by all means, yeah. A one of my uh, recurring viewers and commenters uh vasily uh he he did say earlier he goes oh a fantasy heist game seems really unique it's fun um you know uh, dust city outlaws was a cool concept well executed how can people i mean is it in retail how can people get a copy of dust city outlaws now i mean is it so right, like sold right. through or uh, no right now there's basically two ways you can get it and so, unfortunately it's not at retail but uh you can order it directly through my website uh, you can get it on scratchpadpublishing.com and uh, you can order it directly through there. Also, if you back the Spectaculars Kickstarter, there's actually a double pack option where you get both Spectaculars and Dust City Outlaws. Uh, and that's good because you get Dust City Outlaws at the original Kickstarter price, which is $10 cheaper than the uh, MSRP. Uh, but that won't ship until the end of the Kickstarter. So if you want it right now, you can order it through the website. 
if you want it uh, later, uh, basically you can get it as a double pack with Spectaculars and get the special Kickstarter price for both. Well, I love that. One thing I like about the products that you're putting out from scratch pad is people are either intrigued immediately or not. Right. You know, there's <laughs> they're like, well, let me tell you what this game is. And there's nothing wrong with that, but there's like invisible sun is a, is a fantastic concept of a game that also seeks to solve some of the same problems you do. It's like, you know, people don't have time to, but you've really got to explain what invisible sun is, or you've got to explain <laughs> what, or you've got to explain what Delta green is, or you have to explain what, and they're not, not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, you know, it, it, some games you want to explain, Hey, here's, but a game like this, you're like, boom, it's a fantasy heist. It's a, it's a fantasy. It's a heist movie in, 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 in a fantasy city. Mm -hmm. And people are either like, yup. Or they're like, ah, I might try something else. They just get it or not. Superhero. Look, superhero, self-contained superhero RPG. Uh, you know, we all create the campaign and we take off. And, and, you know, like I said, they're, they're people either get it or don't. Now I'm assuming that's intentional on your part, but is that, yeah, I mean, it definitely yeah. is. Um, I mean, I'm not exactly trying to bust any genres here. I'm trying to right. kind of create the best execution I can of like a gameplay experience of a particular genre. The, uh, the, I think the thing that I end up explaining most to people is if you just get the PDFs of this game, it's not super clear like what like what's unique about it, right? Because you don't have the tactile nature of it. And so one of the things that keeps happening to me is like, I'll go to conventions and I'll take the game with me and I'll sell it there, right? And I'll have people come to me like, oh, hey, I backed this game on Kickstarter and I got the PDFs. I didn't realize it came with all these cards. I didn't realize, and like, even though you have the PDF files for those cards, you don't really realize how important the tactile nature of the components is, how, how that impacts the gameplay, right? Because like, that's the big thing about, the, like I was talking about earlier, the components make it so that it's easier to run on the fly, right? Uh, so I think that one of the things that's tricky about selling my game online and selling my game through Kickstarter and as a PDF and everything is that it's not super clear. Like, oh, why why is this game different? And it's like, oh, well, it's different because it comes with all these physical components. It's different because it's got all these different, you know, uh, cards and dice and tiles and everything that make it easier to run, you know, uh, right. on a like on the fly right so that's that's the element that i end up having to explain to people is like hey as a box set it makes it easier to run and here's why okay cool so uh tell you what i've got a um let's get into actually what it would be like to start the game and yeah and great so let me let me do this i gotta ask you do you uh do you prefer red or green and there's there's a reason i'm asking this uh, are green. you green you're agreeing? Okay, one second. Yeah. So here we go. Hold on. So we're going to go into the world of... Wow. Here. Yeah. I'm loving and, uh, and so here we go. So I'm I'm in it now. I'm, I'm I do not, in fact, have a domino mask to put on, yeah. unfortunately. I was not prepared. Well, I just happened to... Uh, I was at Walmart the other day, and all the Halloween stuff is 50%. Oh, off, sure, so yeah. Yeah, I just, you know, it, it's kind of small, but hey, it'll work, okay. right? So, okay. yeah. So um, I honestly have no idea who you are right now. I, yeah, right. I mean, who is the host of the show? I don't even know. It's yeah, I'm I'm the uh, the Emerald Stranger. That's right. Um, yeah. So I'm the Emerald Stranger. So, okay. Um, what to walk me through what it's like yeah. because there's some random. Uh, stuff that goes on, but and and you said there's four different campaign yeah, types. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so walk us through that. Sure. Okay, so the way it works is before we even start playing, right? The first thing we're gonna do, let's say we've just cracked open a fresh copy of the game. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna open up the setting book, and inside the setting book is a, a two-page spread that's called the basics. And here we're gonna answer some really basic questions about our setting, and it's things like. What decade does this take place in? That's does very important. That is yeah. very important because you go from like the silver age to the, you know, I mean, that's yeah. very important for the, for the atmosphere. Yeah. It's, it's a, a lot of the questions are more about setting the tone for the game than they are about like mechanics, right? And some of them do have mechanical impact, but uh, a lot of it is about like, Hey, you know, we're going to, we're going to set the player's expectations for what this, you know, game is going to be like, right? Uh, then, so we're going to answer the questions like, what decade is it? What, 
genre or uh, are we playing in a real city or a fictional city? So is it like Seattle or Gotham, right? right. Uh, so it's, you know, we answer those questions. Uh, one of the questions is like, what is the sort of most important uh uh, unique element of the city and that's things like oh this is a city that's full of super science or this is right. a city that's built on a dimensional rift or this is a city that has like a, a high population of uh outcasts with superpowers right right uh, and so like, you're gonna pick one of those and that becomes a foundational element for your setting so for example uh, for the live streams that I'm doing during the Kickstarter, I let my Twitter followers and backers and and the audiences for several live streams uh, answer these questions for me using a survey that I posted online. And the result was, okay, it's the 80s, it's Seattle, but it's Seattle that is built on top of a dimensional rift, right? And so basically, like, the, the, by voting on these things, the audience right. was able to create this setting. And I was like, oh, okay, well, it's, uh, you know, it's a dimensional rift, and it's like a portal to hell. And so there's all this infernal influence. Uh, and they tried to build, like, an underground transit system. They dug too deep and yada, yada, right? So uh, basically... Was there, was there a tentacle involved? There was no tentacles, but there tentacles. was some fire and demons. Oh, okay, uh, yeah, so, right. yeah, so basically, uh, you define these basics about your setting. And there's some questions about, like, how common are superheroes? How do the different, how does the media react to superheroes? How does the government react to superheroes? How does the average person react to superheroes? And those end up shaping, like, some elements of the game's mechanics for you as well. But we're going to go. Is, is the intent that all of the, like, if you were doing a campaign at the table, that all of the individual players would help build this? Yes, absolutely. Okay, yeah, you, right. it is assumed okay. that when you define one of these setting elements, the group sort of collaborates to define it together, right? Okay. So we we do the basics, and then after we've got the basics, we're going to pick one of the four series to play through. And the four series are um, Explorers of the Unknown, which is a sort of super science, Fantastic Four-themed uh, series. There's uh, Eldritch Mysteries, which is the sort of magic sorcery themed one. There is uh, Streetlight Knights, which is the sort of street level heroes, street level, right. uh, defend Marvel's Defenders, that kind of thing, right? Uh, and then there's Clash Among the Stars, which is like your cosmic stuff, right? And so we're going to pick one of those four. Uh, uh, right now, I've actually got it so that you have to play a little bit of um, Explorers of the Unknown before you can pick Clash Among the Stars. Now, I've heard a rumor that uh, the the cosmic clash involves eternity rocks uh i'm joking there's no eternity so rocks. or are there there, eternity there are rocks? no eternity rocks but uh, in uh, explores the unknown the super science themed one one of the first things you're going to define is what is your settings like powerful alien artifact and so that's like right. what is your settings equivalent of like the cosmic cube right, right. Uh, but anyway, so we're going to pick one of those pet or one of those series. And, uh, once we start playing, uh, each series comes as like a tear off pad, right? Uh, and so we're going to tear off sheets and like the top, like six sheets are the hero archetypes for the setting, right? So it's like, okay, we're going to, let's say we're going to play explores the unknown, right? So here's your power armor pilot. Here's your, uh, you know, construct Here's your monster, et cetera. Right. Uh, and so your here's your inventor, right? So I hand those out to the players and they are going to start making characters. I'm going to uh, tear off like a sheet for the villain and a sheet for the scenario. And I start reading over those. I actually, as the narrator, I also create the villains. Uh, so that means I'm defining some of the things that are true about the villain. And also on like the backside, I get to make some choices for like what their mechanics are like. While I'm doing that, the players are going to make their characters. And so those characters are composed of an archetype, like power armor pilot or construct or inventor, right? right? Plus... Uh, powers plus an identity and then a team role, right? And the powers, you basically get dealt out five power cards and you can pick one to three of those. The identities, you get dealt out three identity cards and you can pick one of those. And then the team role, there's eight of those and you just pick one of those at the start of every session and you can change team roles every session if you want to. And so uh, basically the players uh, have their archetypes and on the front side of the archetypes is there uh, a bunch of multiple choice questions about like, hey, you know, what, like, what is your character's, uh, you know, basic shtick, right? Like, what are you, what are you all about? What is your character's, um, like, how do you move around? What are your vulnerabilities? What, what is resistance, the, the sort of hit points in the game? What does that mean for your character? And so you're going to answer a bunch of multiple choice questions. You're going to pick some powers. You're going to pick an identity. You're going to pick a team role. And then you're ready to go. And that takes about, like, call it like 10 minutes tops, right? Wow. Uh, 
That's crazy. Yeah. See, that's that's another thing I want to stress to people. If they haven't played Destiny Outlaws, you know, the these games strive, and in my opinion, at least with Destiny Outlaws, are successful in bringing a, a pretty comprehensive role playing dynamic to the table with minimum setup. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. It, it's yeah. a little bit more complicated uh character creation than Dusk City Outlaws because you are making some decisions on the like your character's nature and answering some questions, but right. in general, uh it is pretty fast, right? Uh, and then once you've made those characters, then we're going to start playing the first issue. And the issues are uh, designed to be played in about two to two and a half hours. Um, I, I say two if you're moving at a good clip, two and a half if you play like my group does and you're screwing around a lot, uh, which happens. Uh, I don't know any group that doesn't. I know, right? Right. Uh, so, yeah, it takes about two hours to play through a single issue. And then if you, like, let's say, you know, we come back next week, we want to play again. We, let's say we actually all are really on task and we're going to play for four hours. You just play two issues back to back. Nice. Uh, and so, like, you basically get a nice little resolution. As you're playing through these issues, like I said, the narrator's creating the villains, right? You're occasionally going to get reference to the setting book to fill out a setting element. Like, okay, like, we're going to fill out our powerful artifact. What is that? You answer a bunch of questions. At the end of each issue, you will sometimes get lasting repercussions, which are basically tags that get placed on your character. And then later issues or some villains or some setting elements might then refer back to those tags. And it'll be things like, oh, you know, and it's, it's issue number six. If anybody uh, that any hero that is in the game right now has the tainted by the powerful artifact, um, lasting repercussion, then blah happens, right? right? And so basically there's kind of a, uh, I will call it a light legacy element to it, where basically you're putting like tags on your characters, uh, and then that becomes like a thing that the game references at a later point and then changes the game based on that. Well, that and, actually, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, no that's yeah, fine. Yeah. Uh, that actually answers one of the questions I was going to ask, because especially comics in the 70s and 80s 60s you know that kind of era you know ongoing subplots oh yeah were very important you know the the relationships or the you know the mm -hmm. whatever or the you know the the mean boss or or you know aunt may or or whatever so it sounds like you're touching on that somewhat yeah there's some of that uh in lasting your percussions the other side of it is, let's say, you know, we play that first session, we all have a good time, and we decide we're going to come back and play again, right? Which I hope you will. Uh, so we're going to play a second session, and we're going to play the same heroes, right? At that point, your heroes get a little more depth to them. So at the end of that session, you get your, you know, last year repercussions and everything. You also go ahead and define your character's origin story at that point, uh, which doesn't have any real impact on the game. It's just something that you flesh out. You're then also going to define your character's aspiration and turmoil. And these are two things. They're basically like a sentence that you write. <laughs> turmoil. Yeah. You write these in the first person, right? So it's like, hey, uh, I want to have a relationship with Mary Jane. Or uh, a, a good turmoil would be like, uh, I need to take care of Aunt May, but my life as a hero keeps getting in the way, right? And they're basically, they define something that like you want out of your life that is difficult for you to get because you're a superhero or an obligation that you have that is constantly threatened by your life as a superhero. And so you write these out and then from that point on at the start of every session that you're going to play, each player creates a scene tied to either their aspiration or their turmoil. Ooh, the player gets this, it. Nice. Yeah, okay. the player defines it. And so it'll be, and, and basically the way I frame it is like, tell me something that your hero would do to make that aspect of their life better, right? So it's like, okay, let's say, let's take the, the uh, Spider-Man needs to take care of Aunt May, but his uh, life as a hero keeps getting in the way. Let's oh, say that's- He's gotta like, pick up the eggs. Yeah, that's his, that's his turmoil, but right? Doc Ock- is going to attack. Yeah. The, well, yeah, so, right. so, so yeah. what, so what uh, the player would do is basically like, okay, well uh, to make this part of my life better, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and try and find a like a uh, uh, home care specialist to be with Aunt May when I have to be away as a hero. Right. And so to describe a scene like, Hey, I'm going to go find, you know, a, a home care specialist or whatever. Right. Uh, and then as the narrator, my job is to introduce an obstacle to succeeding in that in the scene. So then like I might do something like, Oh, you know, you, you go find somebody, but like, as you're going to, you know, interview them or whatever, uh, you get an urgent call that there is, or you, you know, you, you find out that there is a, 
uh, a car chase going on uh, in the city, and the you know the the police are having trouble catching this guy, and only Spider Man can catch him, right? Uh, and so you then have to basically say like how you're going to overcome that obstacle or deal with it or whatever in the pursuit of your turmoil, right? Uh, right. And so basically, so each what, player gets to do this. Yeah, the- each player gets one of those, right? Uh, and what happened was I was reading a bunch of comics, you know, for research. Yeah, for research. Uh, uh, and one of the things I noticed, especially about like Marvel comics from like the eighties and nineties is that they all shared a similar pattern where early in the issue, you usually had a scene or two where the heroes were dealing with their real lives. And then you would kind of launch into the main conflict right. of the issue after that. Very right? common. Yeah. Very common. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so this is kind of the same thing. And the thing that I really like about this is that it gives us a chance to see who your character is in their life aside from being a hero. Right. So a great example for my playtest game is um, my buddy, Chris was playing a character named Brushfire. And Brushfire has like fire control powers and he can summon like flaming animals and stuff like that. Uh, And Brushfire's identity is that he's a firefighter. And so he said like, okay, my turmoil is that um, I have an ex-wife and I have a daughter that I don't see enough of. And so that like being a hero uh, creates a rift between me and my my daughter that I they don't get to see. Right. And so then he would create these scenes. It was like, Oh, I go to my ex-wife's house to pick up my daughter for the weekend. And I'd be like, oh, okay, here's the complication blah. Right. And so we got this really interesting story about, you know, brush fire, this hero who's like creating flaming dogs and stuff. Right. right. Uh, who also like basically has this struggle to maintain a relationship with his daughter and like, he's getting pulled away. And, and it was a really sort of fascinating take on like, this character that otherwise like nobody would really like it's okay. Yeah. He's a, he's got fire control and he right. creates animals and stuff like who cares. Right. Um, and so like then brush fires relationship with his ex-wife became a whole thing. And then like another player wove in uh, a turmoil that is, I am unknowingly dating brush fires, ex-wife. Right. <laughs> And so, like, <laughs> then, like, great. his turmoil yeah. scenes then yeah. introduced that player's character right. into the turmoil scenes, yeah. right? Uh, and it was great because it was exactly the kind of thing you would see in, like, right. you know, comics that are, like, let's yeah, be honest, they're part soap opera anyways, oh, they're right? Total. No, they're, you know, I, I even, yeah. I, I'm a huge comic book junkie. And, yeah. like, in the 80s, they consumed, like, 79.4% yeah. of my life. And but it, I had an epiphany like in high school. I was like, these are soap operas. They're yeah, they're yeah. soap operas with superpowers and spandex, but they're soap operas, you yeah. know. And uh, the, at least thing, you know the the, the the typical mainstream yeah color, yeah color absolutely color is yeah. And the thing about these scenes is that you're not just creating these scenes for the fun of it. There's actually a reason why you do that. So if you create a scene for your aspiration, which is aspirations are things like, uh, oh, I'm trying to graduate from college or I'm trying to build up my own company. I'm trying to make it as a model or whatever it is. Right. Right. They're they're a goal that you have. Right. If you build a a scene around your aspiration and you deal with the obstacle that I introduced and you succeed, uh, you basically get an extra check mark on your progress towards your next story reward. Right. So you're getting closer and closer to a reward. If you build one around a turmoil and succeed and dealing with it and everything, right, you get a continuity token. And a continuity token is a thing that you can use to basically introduce uh, retcons and references to back issues that never happened, right? Oh, and cool. So, and yeah. so it's things like, oh, I'm, like I'm in the middle of the scene. I'm going to spend happened off panel, basically. Exactly. Yeah. I'm going to spend my continuity token to refer back to. Uh, oh, my solo series, obviously. And that's right. the thing is like, you also make up a, a, a comic series. book, right? Like, oh, it's your solo series. Oh, or, oh, this is actually from, um, from our team's uh, annual number two. Right. right? Like, oh, right, right, this right. is from the exemplars annual number two, yeah. right? And so you sort of define, you describe like what issue it's from, from a the fake series. The classic annual yeah. number two where right. it was yeah. first introduced that, yeah. Well, you, as you great. recall, yeah. in Professor yeah. Quantum number seventy-five, right? Right. I mean, uh, obviously, yeah. you know that, right? So yeah, yeah it's an, so it's basically an asterisk. It's yeah, like, and and, and then that becomes yeah. that basically becomes uh, like a uh, sort of like the flashback mechanic from games like Leverage, where you basically can describe something that happened in a past issue, and then it just changes the nature of the scene. Oh, that's fun. That is you great. Can also, you can also yeah. use it to define what I call uh, truths. And basically these are things that are true about a character or a team or a setting element or whatever. And so basically it lets you say like, this thing is now true about our setting, right? And it can be something about the villain you're fighting. Like, oh, this villain, 
actually has a horrible fear of spiders or whatever because of and when we know this because in you know right uh the as amazing was seen, Walmart, yeah uh, was, as right. was seen in yeah. issue three yeah yeah the hard to find yet yeah well, well you know in in the backup story to brush right. fire number seven right, right. yeah right. yeah so, like you define that and then every like villain and character and team and setting element has a truths box where you right. write these things in. And like from that point on, it's true. And that's actually a mechanic that I got from, uh, uh, I don't know if it's all gumshoes, uh, gumshoe games, but, right. um, Kevin Culp's time watch and his new one, um, Swords of the Serpentine both use this mechanic well, where it's, it's like oh, to find something true about the setting. And that's the thing is like, this is a game about building your own setting. Right. So I want to have a mechanic where not just when the scenario calls for it, but when you call for it, you can say like, I'm going to make something true about the setting right now. I like that. It's, it's a great fit for a, you know, comic book. Yeah. Um, it, you know, Oh, don't you remember? Like yeah. you mentioned one time, but it's part of Canon. And yeah, I, I see. I love that too, because yeah. it's such a comic yeah. book geek thing. To oh, do. totally. No, dude, like me, is, uh, I remember reading, I'm going to go find it. Yeah, there it is right, right there. Yeah, no, it's, it's great. So well, I'll tell you, <laughs> speaking of mechanics, we've got a viewer question. I'm going to put oh, on yeah, great. my plus two spectacles of viewer feedback here. Um, the mullet said one problem with other supers RPGs is mechanical balance mm. with hundreds of superpowers that need to work in the same framework. I guess this kind of, you know, ties back to, we're talking about magic being um, involved, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. I, he said, is that something you've encountered as you develop spectaculars? Yeah. So uh, I will I'll just go ahead and say up front, this game absolutely flattens the power curve on superpowers. Right. Uh, and that's partially due to the fact that like, you know, you see Daredevil in a comic next to Iron Man, next to Dr. Strange, and they work right. just fine next to each other. And like, sure. Like you have things that are in your character's idiom, but like I want these kinds of characters to exist next, exist next to each other. Cause even though like we might be playing through the cosmic series, maybe you brought your character from the super science series with you or from the street level series. Right. So like, yep, it's totally daredevil in space. Why? I don't right. know. Right. Sure. But Why not? I didn't, I didn't want there to have to be like a huge power curve. So the powers themselves don't have like a, like strength to them or whatever. Every character just has a percentage chance of success. And depending on what slot you put those powers in on your character sheet, that determines how strong you are. So you can totally, or how, how good you are with that power. So you can totally have things like, oh, okay, the Hulk has super strength in his, his, you know, highest slot. And, right. you know, Thor has super strength, but it's like one step down. And uh, Iron Man also has like super strength. He doesn't, but whatever. Uh, or, or like Spider-Man or whatever. Right. And so like basically like slot you put it in gives you that little bit of granularity. Uh, but overall, like I, I just flatten the power curve and say like, yeah, these characters can exist next to each other and it's fine. Uh, that having been said, every power card does have a couple of unique mechanics on it. Uh, some of them are power stunts, which are shared across powers. Uh, but some of them are like completely unique and aren't on any other cards. And for those, basically, a lot of it just boils down to um, uh, the, the fact that I'm uh, I have Peter Lee, who was my sort of partner in crime on Lords of Waterdeep, is my developer, and so he and I are working closely to make sure that like the powers and archetype abilities and everything right. are balanced with each other. Um, but also, like, it's kind of a game about being creative with your powers and everything. So the the uh, most of the mechanics are actually really straightforward. And they do what they do, and it's up to you to sort of skin it how you want to skin it. Sure. Okay. Well, uh, and and I don't, you know, I'm I'm good time wise, but we're a little over an hour now, so. Well, we had some I, technical difficulties, so yeah, yeah. You know, well, we we lost a couple minutes. More. Yeah, but yeah. You know, I want, I definitely want you to share what you want to share, but I don't want to keep you longer. You know, I know you're hectic right now. Um, sure. This so like 10, 15 more minutes, I'll be fine. Okay. Great, um, man. I really appreciate it. So. Yeah. One thing that caught my eye that you're doing with um, Spectaculars, which was actually one of the things that I liked about Villains Vigilantes, was that character cre creation can be somewhat random. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and I, I like that. I, I, I don't think there's any such thing as a broken character. I think that, that, that you get a character that, you know, you're like, oh, that's not the character I would have chosen. But then over time, you kind of stretch and 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 role play and and learn. Oh, this is a great character. You know, uh, but a lot of people these days, you know, they're used to 
pretty much almost like custom designing their characters from the ground up, uh, even if there's rolling involved. So mm -hmm. is there a, is there, can people do either random or build or how does that work? Well, so the default assumption is that there's a pretty high random element to it. But I mean, that being said, all these powers and everything, they come on cards. So right. you can just like go through the deck and find what you wanted to. And like, I, just like with the city outlaws, there'll be pages on optional rules. And one of those optional rules is going to be like, you just pick your cards instead of getting them dealt out to right. you. Uh, that being said, I think the value of the random character creation is sort of twofold. One, it makes things faster. It just means that you're not digging through a deck of, I mean, right now the deck of powers is uh, 80 cards. No, nice. yeah, whatever it is. Um, it's a lot of cards. Uh, that's the numbers fluctuated. Um, but, you know, it just takes a long time to flip through those. Uh, and then part of it's also, I think there's something really fun about the puzzle element of random character creation. I, so like, I, I'm with you hundred percent. I love it. Yeah. And so like you get, get dealt out these identities, these powers and everything. And then you pick an archetype and you're like, okay, how do I make these things fit together in a way that's interesting and compelling. Right. Uh, and, and so like a lot of the best characters we've had so far are people being like, Oh, okay, well I got this random assortment of powers and this archetype and this identity, what does this mean? And they come up with an idea. It's like, Oh, of course that's what that means. That's perfect. Right. Yeah, That's exactly what I mean by stretching. You yeah. Know, you stretch a little bit, come out of what, and, and like I said, the, I don't believe there's any such thing as a broken or unworkable character. You know, it's yeah. like, let's have fun with it. Let's, what are the dots? How does this stuff connect? Yeah. You know, let's and, get crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And especially like, I think this is probably more true in superheroes than in like traditional fantasy games, right? Where like the randomness can sometimes uh, be difficult to figure out like what it means for your character. But in this, like where it's like, oh, I have this assortment of powers and these identities. How do these fit together? Like, that's just like, it's a fun game that you play, right? Right. Um, and then there is some mitigation of that where there are five different basic powers that are um, let's see here, flight, energy blast, super strength, super toughness, and signature weapon. There's four copies of those. Those are not put into the deck. And so as you're building your character, you can always choose one or more of those generic powers uh, and put, and add them to your character, right? So it's right. like, okay, well, I, you know, I don't love this array of powers that I got, but I got this one thing that I like. So I'm going to take, you know, uh, fire manipulation and then I'm going to take energy blast from the generic ones and put those together. And so like, that's my characters. I'm kind of a blasty fire manipulator, right? Because like maybe my other powers didn't come out that way. So there is some sort of mitigation uh, to the randomness as well. Um, but then, you know, I'm not going to tell you what to do at your home table, right? You want to dig through the deck, dig through the deck. That's fine. Right. Exactly. So oh, no, who is this masked villain? Who is I'm actually the arch nemesis, <laughs> right? I'm Shane works. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so, um, okay. So, um, the other thing I kind of wanted to touch on was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the one of the cases and the points that Villains of Vigilantes made, I, I call back to Villains of Vigilantes a lot sure. because one of, it was one of my primary role playing. That I actually played V and V and Traveler before I really seriously played D and D. Although you know, yeah, I'm a huge D and D guy. Sure. Um, so you know, V and V made the point very well. I thought that you know, in most other RPGs like D and D or whatever, you keep leveling up and getting more powerful and powerful and powerful. And, you know, V and V was like, that doesn't, you know, when, when, like Spider-Man doesn't tend to get more powerful over time. He's more experienced, mm -hmm. you know, how often does Superman add a new power? You know, right. even though I, they, they did give Superman sort of this like sure Nova burst thing a couple of years and he ago. turned into electricity at some point. Yeah. Like he's like, but the, for the <laughs> most part, what, tends to change with superheroes yeah. is their personal life or their experience mm -hmm. and how well they are at using their powers rather than well hey suddenly i've got super speed because i leveled up so right uh but i did you mentioned earlier uh it wasn't drama points i can't remember what you called it there was they earned oh, the continuity uh, tokens yeah so is i mean do they how does that work? How, do, how sure. does so you're really different? talking about progression here? And so right. basically every character has like a story track that they're checking off uh, points on. And like once you right. hit thresholds, you're going to get a story reward. And basically story rewards range from there's sort of three categories, right? The first category is uh, they're basic upgrades, right? And it's things like you get another hero point every conflict or here's an extra skill that you have or um, 
once per conflict, you can just regain 25 resistance, which are like your hit points, right? Uh, and so like there are some straight up upgrades that are just like, hey, you are getting more experienced. You're getting better at this. It's not numerical increases necessarily, although there is one option that's basically like, hey, you know, pick one of your powers and so many times per session you can, you know, use it at a higher percentage right. chance, right? So uh, there's like, there's some pretty basic progression stuff that is just about you becoming more experienced as a character. They give you some more survivability and some more capabilities. Right. Right. And there's another category that are, I call them sort of reconfiguration abilities, right? Uh, reconfiguration upgrades. And this is thing, this is a chance for you to add new powers or change out your powers or rearrange your powers or get a new identity or change or, or whatever. Right. So like basically like big changes to who your character is, right. Change archetypes. Right. And all of these are framed around a comic book trope. So, for example, if it was like, okay, I'm going to hand off, uh, or I'm going to, you know, take this option that lets me change my identity. So, what this actually is is this is you handing off the mantle of your hero to another person, right? Oh. So it's like, you know, Steve Rogers retires and Falcon takes over as Captain America, right? Uh, and it's framed around that idea that, like, yeah, you're passing the torch to another hero. So okay. you describe that, and then you get to reconfigure your character mechanically, right? So you keep playing the character, but yeah, totally, yeah. But it's a different. Okay, well, yeah, that. I mean, you've got yeah, blue. I mean, Green Lantern, Blue Beetle. Yep. Uh, yep. It's it's happened a lot. Yep. I mean, and sometimes so, it sticks, sometimes it doesn't. But yeah, anyway. and, and sometimes it's things like uh, you get a new costume, right? right? So you get to add a new a new power. Robin or, New War from now on. Uh, I'm Night Nightwing. Nightwing. Right. Yes, exactly. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. That kind of thing. Like, oh yeah, you graduate from, you know, rookie hero to, to, you know, right. like I'm a full fledged hero. Right. Uh, but all of those are sort of arranged around like the different troops. Uh, and then the last one is the, uh, uh, sort of retirement rewards, right. And these are basically a way that your character kind of exits the campaign, uh, as a, a playable character. And it can be things like, oh, you have an epic character death, or it can be things like, you know what? Your character turns evil. Like you, you, you do a heel turn, and you Green Lantern becomes Parallax. Parallax, right? right exactly. Yeah. Right. Uh, and so, like then at that point, it's like go create a villain that represents wow. this character and give it to the narrator, right? Uh, or it can be things like you know your character like goes off into space or whatever, right? And they're basically just a way for you to modify the setting by retiring this character. And a lot of that's like you don't ever have to do one of those necessarily, but it can also be things like okay, your character vanishes and someone else is going to take over as them. Uh, and, but like, it's a, it's a major reconfiguration, right? So think like when Jean-Paul Valley became Batman in the nineties, right. Right? right? So it's not just like a different person, but it's a different costume, a different, you know, set of powers and everything, right? Effectively a new hero, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so like, then at that point, it's like, okay, you're starting over from scratch as a new hero. You, you have a tie to your previous hero, but then that hero sort of retired into the hall of fame. Right. Or it can be things like, yeah, you know what? Steve Rogers is retiring as captain America and now he's the head of shield. Right? right. And so basically like now this major NPC in the setting is your former character. Right. So basically nice. it, it's sort of a farewell to your character in a way that leaves a mark on the setting permanently. This is interesting. Yeah. So um, I, I, I love the, the design work you're putting into to maybe not necessarily encourage these things to happen, but it's built in to allow them to happen. You know, it's like, Hey, you know what? I'm kind of, I'd like to try something different, you know, or, yeah. or whatever. And then, and it's not disruptive. Like the, the tools are already there to easily, you know, yeah. kind of work it in and, and, and keep the campaign going. So well, that's, that's, you know, really I, cool. I yeah. love these, these comic book events, right? Like, Oh, this character's retiring and passing on the mantle right. and this and that. And those are, they're awesome, but it's hard to write those into a scenario because you don't know what state the player characters are going to be in at any given time, right? right? So instead, I'm putting that on the players and saying like, hey, when that's great. It, it's time for you to get this reward, introduce this way that your character that exits, way. right? Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. great. Yeah. So it's, you know, what's interesting, uh, I'd imagine it would have happened in an ongoing campaign for the same exact reasons that major publishers do it. Mm -hmm. to shake things up or to, you know the campaign we have you know let's shake it up a little bit or i'm kind of I'm kind of bored with this character like you know and, and so it's almost the exact same reason yeah. you know 
uh, w w would would probably lead to yeah. something like that. So let's, well, I, you know, and let's just do things like okay, like here's the one your character's going to exit and then they die in a tragic you know way right. and oh no, like he's dead, right? And then like let's say you play another character for a while and it's time for you to make a new character after that, right? It's like oh well. I'm going to bring back that old character. That little character comes back from the dead. Right. And so that becomes like mm -hmm. another sort of retirement thing for that. The new character you're playing is like, okay, like, <laughs> it's like you the, gotta go now, kid. <laughs> at the end of this character's time, like now that old character comes back. Right. And so it's right. like a, let, lets you sort of play with those yeah, very that. comic booky tropes. That's fantastic. Yeah. I, I could definitely see how you've seen, uh, I can definitely see how you've really, uh, built on what you did with us city outlaws for a more campaign oriented yeah. approach. So I think yeah. that's great. Yeah. I, you know, I've, I've, I'm, I, I mean, I'm already thinking like all this cool stuff that could happen. So that, yeah, that, that sounds really fun. So um, let's talk, let's make sure it's on Kickstarter right now. You it know, is on Kickstarter right now. Yes. Today's November 4th. Let me pull up 16 days. Yeah, you got 16, 16 days. 16 days. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Let me pull it up. Uh, doo -doo -doo. okay, so there it is. Spectaculars RPG. Mm -hmm. Um, you're at about the halfway point on both, uh, on both the campaign and funding. So, um, how I mean, do you do you feel? I mean, how do you how does that compare to where Dust City was at? I mean, are you feeling good it's a little it's a little yeah. behind where Dust City was, but it's still okay. pretty good. So, Dust City also had uh, like a, a very big first two days. Um, but if you look at sort of like my day over day for this one, it's I'm, I'm getting a lot more backers day over day than I did on Dust City Outlaw. So, I think we're trending well. Um, I, I think the game's gonna fund uh, as long as you know people back it, right? <laughs> right? Well, you've also um, got the uh, what is that that sort of uh not stereotypical i can't think of the word i'm uh, the ubiquitous when people mm -hmm. talk about q starter kickstarter they talk about the the u shape right it's very short yep yep then you u at the end so you yeah. come at the end yeah and i've only had one of my live streams so far so like that like the i ran on loading ready run last monday and yeah uh, take a moment tell, coming people, up. tell people about those so they can you know uh, yeah wait, how you're doing it like every what night is it that you're doing? Uh, well, so so um, I have live streamed games that I'm running for people. So like last Monday was Loading Ready Run uh, on the, I want to say the 14th. Um, uh, I've got one at Penny Arcade and I got a couple more that oh, I haven't announced yet. Right. Fantastic. Uh, Penny Arcade today. But then I'm also on Thursday nights. Uh, I did one last Thursday and I'm going to keep doing them for the next uh, couple of Thursdays. I'm doing a live Q and a on Kickstarter. And that's basically just like Kickstarter has a, a, a Kickstarter live streaming thing. Right. And so right. what I do is I just log on, I turn on my camera and microphone and I take questions from the chat. Right. And you can submit ch questions in advance. There'll be another one next Thursday that people can, uh, can tune into. And so it's just a chance to like, if you just want to chat with me, we can just chat about, things oh, and i can fun. answer your questions right yeah that's just, i mean it's just a great way for me to actually talk to the people who are backing the game or who are thinking about backing the game so i'm going to keep doing those for the duration of the campaign well i definitely wanted you know to help uh i, I i've you know i love what you did with dust city outlaws plus i'm a i'm a huge superhero nerd you know yeah. i love role-playing games but if you if you said you got to choose playing games or reading comic books the rest of your life That'd be hard, man. I may have to go with the comic <laughs> books. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a big comic book nerd. Now, I did want to share uh, this, and you know, I'm sure you've seen this, Rodney. But yeah. uh, and you got to take this stuff with a grain of salt, of course. Yeah. But, but Kick Track has you, you know, well, you know, doing yeah. doing well above your, mm -hmm. yeah. So I hope it, you know, I hope it does. And you know, Kick Track is is only as good as is its predictive analysis. And sure. but I, you know. I, I've rarely seen an estimate that, you know, strong not make it. So, yeah. so yeah, hopefully you're feeling pretty good right now, but it's, I, it's, I am, yeah. it's never over till the, uh, till the fat superpowered lady with a sonic scream. Yeah. Uh, see, right. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's it's got a long ways to go still. Um, I'm pretty confident that we're going to fund. Uh, I'd really like us to get into the stretch goals because I've got some pretty exciting stuff uh, lined up for that if I can. It's just things that, like, if I can do a bigger print run, then I right. can just put them in the box. I mean, it's what I did with Dusk City Outlaws where, like, as we hit higher backing numbers, I can print more copies so I can put, like, here's this whole other extra deck of cards I can put right. in there. Whatever. Sure. Just because, like, the per game cost goes down, right? <laughs> Um, so yeah, like I, I basically, I pump all the extra, like, 
you know, beyond the goal money back right back into the game. So the more backers we get, the better everybody's copy of the game gets. Okay. Well, why, why don't we finish up this way game wise? And then I have sure. another question for you. Okay. Do you want to kind of highlight some of the pledge levels you think that are the most, maybe the most attractive to folks or, yeah, or maybe I mean, even a higher end pledge level that, you know, uh, is super attractive for some reason. Right. Well, so the, the, there's the, uh, the Paragon level, which gets you the game shipped to your house, right? Like that's the, and that's the main where, one that, that's yeah. where I've backed at here. Yeah. And that's, so, I, I think yeah. that's going to be, you know, like that, that's going to get you the game and get you an idea of like what this game is all about and let you really, you know, play the game the way it's meant to be played. Uh, I also have a double pack that's available uh, to, for people in the U.S. and the U.K. That is basically you get a copy of Spectaculars and you get a copy of Dusk City Outlaws. And the double pack, uh, the Dusk City Outlaws sh- uh, copy will ship as soon as the campaign ends. So basically campaign closes. I will basically collect your shipping addresses and send your Dusk City Outlaws out immediately. So you get one game now, one game next August, right? Right. And, and let me, and, let me just pitch dust city again. I mean, if, if, <laughs> if people, if, if this is affordable, you know, affordable in somebody's budget, uh, I, I, you know, I personally recommend doing that because, uh, dust city is a great game to have around. Um, you know, it's, it's, again, I can't, I can't stress this enough. It really hit that sweet spot of what do you want to do tonight? I don't know. I don't want to really play a board game, but we don't have time for an art. Yeah. We got time for a role playing game and you just go pop it off the shelf and, and, and Bob's your uncle, as they say. Indeed, is as they say. So, mm. anyway, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. I guess. Uh, yeah. And then I've got the cosmic upgrade right now, which uh, also gets you a set of campaign coins for the game. These are the metal tokens. Uh, they were great for Dusk City Outlaws, and uh, they're going to be awesome for Spectaculars as well. It's quite a few more coins this time around than it was uh in dusk city outlaws so right. that's a bigger part of it and then you also get an extra set of advantage and challenge dice which just make it easier to pass dice around the table so it's basically the cosmic hero is the is the paragon level with some cool extra yeah with the metal, and, metal and, tokens and, and the extra okay. set of advantage and challenge dice yeah nice yeah, they're, they're like they're really great campaign coins does awesome stuff uh their their dust city outlaws coins were amazing so i'm really excited about the, what they've got uh uh coming for spectaculars yeah i've, I've uh I, I i backed one of their kickstarters yeah. a couple of years ago so i have every now and then when when i'm playing D D or whatever and i want that clinky you know like i'll drop a bag on the table and it makes that right. nice clinking or you know i'll pull some out and yeah. you know have it have have the npc sort of you know, rummaging or shuffling coins in their hand. Yep. Now, I also wanted to point out this here: the retailer, five copies yeah. for retailers only. Yes, right? that's right. Yeah. Okay. Basically, like I just got a lot of feedback uh, from my last campaign that people were like, "Hey, I really wanted to back this as a retailer," uh, and uh, so I added it this time around. Okay. Well, I I have to. One of my radio show sponsors, anyway, is Game Goblins in Rock, Oh Arkansas, yeah. And they often uh, will uh, do re- will support. Uh, the Kickstarter or the retailer stuff for Kickstarters. So yeah, the nice the nice part about this one is for retailers. Yeah. Basically, you yeah. get it at the wholesale price, and then also uh, it gets shipped out at the same time that everybody else's do. So they go right onto shelves. Nice. Okay. Well, and and like I said, there's you said 16 days left in the. Uh, That's right. Yep. You got 16 days, and what do you get? A successful uh, Kickstarter, and I can't think of anything to rhyme. So there you go. I also want to point out that uh, once we hit 500 backers, I'm going to reveal the next uh, guest creator that is coming wow. out. Uh, so basically, like with Dusk City Outlaws, I'm having some guests come in and design some scenarios. Cool. Uh, additionally, this time around, what I'm going to do is once we break that 500 backer mark, I'm also going to reveal multiple uh, guest creators. But then, like you know, we still have to unlock them as we get to a certain tier, right? So. Uh, uh, right. Basically, yeah, like the more more backers uh, means more guest creators. All right. So and I'm not I'm not trying to commit you to anything. I know you're focusing on spectaculars right now, but this game is obviously lends itself to a continuing series of yeah. new campaigns, new this. I mean, is that kind of rattling around in the back? No, of your absolutely. Um, yeah. With with Dust City Outlaws, I really want it to be a self-contained box set. But with this one, uh, I think it's there's a really clear avenue for expansion with new series. So uh, if this game gets made and it's successful and people like it, then I will almost certainly be creating new series in the future with different genres. So like 
uh, for example, one of the ideas that uh, we've been kicking around. I have a little writer's room of, uh, of narrative designers that I work with, right? Uh, but one of the ideas we've been kicking around is what if there was a series where you play as villains, right? And so you can basically choose to play as sort of a Suicide Squad or Thunderbolts right. type uh, scenario, right? And, and so like, that's the kind of thing that I would love to do, but it's not really core to the experience. So uh, that's the direction I'm thinking about. And I gotta say, for modern comics, and I'm, I'm, I'm considering modern comics like the '90s through now, right? Uh, sure. but, uh, one of the last great shocking reveals in comics was when the Thunderbolt Thunderbolts turned out to be the Masters of Evil. That was right. such a, that was such a great uh, I love arc or, or whatever, you know. And then they managed to keep telling interesting Thunderbolts stories after that. But um, yeah. yeah, that was you know, it's it's comic book readers have aged up in a lot of ways. And so they've become, they've read so much. They're almost jaded. So it's hard to pull off those, those great, <laughs> like yeah. shocking, what Gwen Stacy died kind of right. moments. And, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm a huge I'm Thunderbolts Thunder fan. I'm a huge, uh, Kurt Busiek fan. So yeah, like, I am too. Oh, anything he amazing. touches, I will. I yeah. love Astro city. Astro city is so amazing. Oh, amazing. Uh, yeah. And, and you know, he's, uh, the the monthly series is ended, but he's going to start doing, mm -hmm. you know, graphic novels. Oh, yeah. Every time he puts out a new issue, I always tweet out. I said, "You really should be reading Astro City, the most yeah, yeah. the most human stories in comics. They're absolutely absolutely fascinating stuff. I love Kurt. Uh, yeah. I love his work. So, yeah, me too. Uh, which well, that leads me into I was going to wrap here unless there if, unless there's something you want to share about the game. You know, you're like nobody ever asked me this. You know, no, I think you know, I think we've hit the most of it actually. Okay, so um. Let me take off my mask here. <laughs> um, so, uh, who like what are you reading right now? Or, or as far or as comics you, goes, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah, yeah. I actually just finished re uh, reading the original Dave Stevens Rocketeer series, which I'm, I'm a huge fan of the movie, right? Yeah. Uh, and so I bought the the trade paperback. They just did a, a new printing, let's say earlier this year, that I grabbed. Uh, so grab that. I've also been rereading a lot of classic X Men. Uh, so like I got the um, Marvel is doing these really great trades that have uh, sort of a, a huge chunk of different series all at once. I think they're called like the essentials. And right, so like huh? I, yeah. I, I, I just uh, finished reading the X factor one. Uh, I also uh, did kind of a deep dive into my nineties nostalgia. And so uh -huh. I read like uh, a bunch of the different um trades for like events from the the 90s so like i reread the whole death and return of superman and i reread i just recently reread uh the fatal attractions event from x-men which i'm a huge x-men fan and fatal attractions sort of hit me right in my prime uh uh superhero comics reading in high school right and so like i reread that and i was it was a nice trip down memory lane and reminding me like wow like i forgave a lot in the 90s <laughs> yeah yeah well it's a different you know as you when you go back here's what i've personally encountered uh with with i've been reading comics i'm 46 now and i've been reading comics since like the late 70s early 80s uh and was absolutely consumed with them in high school it's hard to it's hard i mean i i was a big role-playing game guy but comics would just got into me uh, and, and what I've found as I go back and reread stuff, I sort of hit this middle period where everything I was rereading, I was like, this is, what is this? How, how did I like this? But then I come back to it again about 10 years later and I'm like, oh, this is really good. So yeah. it, it's weird how you mentally, I, I don't know how to explain it. Well, for uh, me, like I, I, it's not even like the writing of the art or anything that right. always gets me. It's I'm always surprised at how forgiving I was with how deeply entwined all these stories were yeah. like right. in continuity. Cause like when I was in high school, I had no money to spend right. on comics. Right? So I got like things here and there very rarely I could afford to buy like an ongoing series or something. Right. But like, reading those old X-Men comics, like Fatal Attraction spanned like six different books. It made references to all these other comics that I know for a fact that I did not read in high yeah, school. But at right. the same time, I was just like, whatever, don't care. This is amazing. Yeah. Give me more. Right. I know, yeah, so well, like, yeah. You would have these, this gapish sort of yeah. reading experience, but you kind of, you know, yeah, there'd be characters. I had, yeah, I had, like, I have no idea who this character yeah. is. Right. But okay. Yeah. They got, and they still do it to a certain extent, but they got really bad about, 
I, I don't mind crossover events at all. Yeah. But make sure if I read the main series that I can follow what's going on. And it got to where you like Final Crisis, I think. I read the trade paperback of that and it made no sense because everything was happening, you know, yeah. off in, in these other. I, I don't know. There was cool moments in it, but I still couldn't tell you what happened because all I did was read the main story. So, yeah. which I, I, I think is, I'm, I, I don't think that's doing good service to your fans. Um, it's actually the opposite of fan service, but, um, hmm. but, but for the most part, I mean, I'm, I'm a big, big mainstream four me color too. spandex yeah, comics nerd. Yeah. So, um, well, you know, I don't know if you read anything current, but the X-Men is actually kind of back on an up upward swing right oh, now. Yeah. Uh, Rose, have you read any of Matthew Rosenberg's stuff? No, not yet. But like, I, I kind of so follow good. tangentially a little bit. Um, yeah. And you know, like I'm, yeah. I'm always behind on things. But like, yeah, I, I'm a huge X Men fan, and it's all like every time there's a new creative team, I always check it out a little bit. Right. Well, Matthew Rosenberg is firing on all cylinders. His, uh, he did a uh, a New Mutants uh, limited series called Lost Souls, which is excellent. Mm -hmm. He's writing X Men, which is excellent. Um, he's his punisher is yeah like i don't even it's just amazing uh it's 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 really really good so uh some other writers out there i'm really enjoying right brian edward hill i don't know if you know mm -hmm. of him or not but he's he's writing really amazing stuff and uh you know there's it's i feel like it's a good time to be reading comics absolutely right now. Yeah. yeah there's a lot there's of great lot stuff of, out there yeah there's a lot of really fun stuff all right well uh last question is okay. the, uh are those three covers hanging up behind you have a uh, nostalgia value or do you just like the art uh so they actually are all three different uh yeah. so i'll start over there on the far side uh, i yeah. had that i so, bought that issue when it came yeah. out so that's that green lantern that was actually a gift from my buddy dan who is one of the writers on my uh writer's room team for spectaculars uh and he knows that i love green lantern i'm a huge green lantern fan of like all different green lanterns uh maybe not so much guy gardner but uh see i'm a huge guy nerd Okay. Uh, yeah, but I don't like him now. But I liked it. I liked him when he was the dripping puddle of testosterone. <laughs> right. That they did in the eighties. Yeah. yeah. And the Daredevil one behind me. Uh, that was a gift from my buddy Chris, who is in my playtest group. Uh, he got it at uh, Emerald City Comic Con, and uh, it just fits so well with these others back here. And the back behind me, that's actually the poster for the Death of Superman series from 1994. Uh, this one is actually the actual poster that was on my wall as a kid growing oh, up. Um, that's uh, and basically I, I retrieved it from my parents' house and framed it and put it up in my game room. Uh, yeah. So like it's the it's actually out of the uh, the black bagged uh, uh, Death of Superman. Uh, right, right, yeah. Where they had the armband yeah. and all that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I remember that. There was a guy. I anyway. The, I remember the frenzy when that came out. So, yeah. um, you know, I did. What, I'll end on this unless you want to add anything. Um, when when the death of Superman happened, right, <laughs> uh, I I was like, this is this is stunt. This is just a big stunt. It's ridiculous. Da da da. But I read it, you know, and and kept up with it and everything. I've gone back and reread the death and return of Superman several times, including the reign of the Superman. Mm -hmm. It's actually a really good overall arc. I mean, it's. It, it's it's not just stunt. I you know it's, it's really interesting things going on. And, I mean, look, I, I was yeah. fourteen when it came out, yeah. right? So maybe my taste was not exactly super refined, but it was yeah. a big thing yeah. for me. And the thing was, I was completely caught off guard by the whole like Superman is back, but there's four of him, right? Yeah, that was great. That, that, that was twist. I think is actually yeah. like legitimately good, right? That yeah. it's just like not just like okay, yeah, he died, now he comes back, but like for a while there like you could i mean the comics didn't always disguise it super well but you could reasonably say like oh which one of these four is the real one and i actually wish they dragged it out a little longer so yeah. that you were left guessing longer right. like which one of these is actually the real superman but the problem was like you knew john henry irons wasn't because he was steel right and right. like you, you knew who that character was right uh so you knew it wasn't steel but like you know like I would have liked a little more mystery like around it. Like give me another, give me another well, six months of mystery and then do all the reveals. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, and, and, you know, I don't know if you're keeping up with the DC animated movies, but yes, uh, I just saw the, the yeah, death the of Superman. Superman. Super yeah. good. 
Yeah, and they, almost almost every I've got them all. The the DC animated mm -hmm. stuff is is kicking tail left oh, yeah. and right. So yeah. I just um, rewatched uh, New Frontier actually, uh, which it's great. Yeah. I love the New Frontier comics, right? Yeah, but yeah, yeah. No, that's it's it's. There's only been even the weak ones are good, right? You know, <laughs> yeah. uh, but there's a couple of them. Yeah, but but like Crisis on Two Earths was oh so good, amazing. So good. But yeah, well we could, okay, we're, I got to rein it in, but yeah. Um, no pun intended rain of superman but yeah it's you know it's 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 really good stuff and you're right they 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 gave hints that any of those four might really be kal-el in some sense yeah, like in the even, lead up anyways yeah and then of course you know the eradicate or cyborg superman yeah, blasted yeah. the eradicator and coast city got blown up and everything went to heck which okay no i gotta end on this since we like we both like green lantern I never have liked the how went spiraled off into insanity thing. And I, it just, it didn't fit his character, but Hey, yeah. what the heck, you know, I don't know. And like I said, I was 14. So yeah, was you're like, ah. I was like well, whatever, was, this is amazing. I was like a big Hal Jordan nut and I'm like, yeah. what? he wouldn't, what? And, and here's my geek quibble. If we're going to quibble about being <laughs> geeks. Okay. You, if you have a, uh, a green lantern ring, right. It's already only limited by your will and your, so multiple rings doesn't make you more powerful. So okay. that's my geek complaint. But it was a great visual on that cover when he had all sure. those rings. Oh, yeah. So oh, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I like how you're just like, I'm just gonna let him yeah, no, I'll I'm, let you go. I'm gonna let him be a geek, <laughs> geek, geek rant and convetch because that's right. that's part of being a geek. Oh hey Rodney, I really appreciate you yeah. uh, taking the time. Like I said, my my radio show is actually on pause for football. Right. Uh, uh, but I was like, ah, you know, I want I want to help out scratch pad and, I appreciate and uh, that. And, you know, so let's, let's do this and at least get that out there, uh, you know, while football is going in the past, I've always bounced around frequencies during football. Right. And this year I said, you know what, I'm just gonna, I've been on the air almost four years. I'm just going to take a, like a three or four week break and, uh, and just let football be football. And my sure. wife will actually see me on Saturdays. So, <laughs> but I wanted to help you out. Thanks, Everybody man. that's, yeah. Whether people are watching live and we have had a pretty solid five or six people watching live at any given time. Uh, so whether people are watching live uh, or they're watching after the fact, appreciate you watching uh, mention again, your live streams, uh, Rodney. So. Yeah. On Thursday nights, uh, I'll be doing Q and A's and then I've got a few more that are listed on the actual Kickstarter page to watch actual play happening. Right. If somebody, do you happen to know on Kickstarter, if you're like, oh, I'm not quite sure if I want to place, if they hit remind me later, will they still get the Kickstarter updates or do you have to pledge? No, to you updates? have to pledge to get the uh, backer only updates, which there's only one, okay. there's only been one backer only update so far. And, and okay. so like, that's not a big deal, but like, yeah, remind me later basically just says like, Hey, come back in the last 48 hours. Right. I hit that on, I hit that on a lot, you know, yeah. so it, it never hurts. Right. Yeah. Just send me yeah. a reminder. Yeah. Um, the other, th other thing is I'm definitely not trying to invite myself into your play testing. Okay. I want, let me, let me, uh, preface this. <laughs> if you find yourself like on a live stream, needing somebody sure. or even not on a live stream, sure. I think, I think it'd be fun to help you out. So yeah, again, I'm not trying to muscle in. I'm just no, saying I get it. if you're looking for somebody <laughs> and, and I have the time, I'd, I'd be happy to help you out. Awesome. So. Thanks, man. I appreciate the offer. All right. Well, I, I look forward to, uh, um, this game successfully funding uh and and the little iron men here look forward to it too. <laughs> they look so, forward to it too yeah so since it's been halloween they're gonna come play with us rodney <laughs> forever forever and ever and ever. ever all right man take care uh up, and, yeah I'm, like i said i'm looking forward to getting my eager little hands on spectaculars thanks for watching everybody and we will catch you next time on shame plays take care rodney see you man